Now, Bluetooth itself is owned by a company. And the name of the company is SIG. So SIG, it's a company on its own and they own Bluetooth. They own the IP, they own the mark, they own the logo, everything around it. And their job at that time was also not just, you know, coming up with the standard of, you know, how Bluetooth works, but also stopping other people from generating protocols that could combat this. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, people of the internet. Welcome to Not Just Design Pod, and I'm your host, Drones. This story started in 1800s, like actually 1800. So Bluetooth is a short form communication technology that uses radio waves. This means that the Bluetooth itself would not exist if it wasn't for the invention of radio itself. And radio we know is wireless communication through the air. In the early 1800s, the scientists Hans Christian Ostred and Michael Faraday, they came up with an idea. They postulated the idea of electromagnetic waves. Like it was the idea that who this is this thing that transfers through this medium and that medium. And let's call it electromagnetic waves. But in 1864, 64 years after, an experimental physicist named James Clark Maxwell he also does made a theory that electromagnetic waves could be transmitted through air rather than just wire. Now, that expanded the idea and the knowledge that he had this theory. He was like, you know, theoretical physicists, they basically think most of the time using the already laid out principles of physics. And then they use that to come up with potential good guesses. That's, that's what we call it. But these guesses have mathematical calculations that back. And he said, that these electromagnetic waves, quote unquote, could transfer through air rather than just wire. And then a few years later, another guy picks it up. His name was Heinrich Heads. And now, Heinrich Heads was the first person to prove what Maxwell was saying. Now, he said that the theory was correct and he created radio waves that could transfer through air. And so, in honor of Heinrich Heads, they named the unit of a frequency to be heads. Work with me. Now, radio waves itself were just being studied in the lab because after all of this, you have, you know, ah, no, 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 let's understand this, let's test this, let's do this. Many technologies that we see now for, have existed four years before. They were just being tested around the labs and not being public. Not all of us are scientists, so we can't basically know. But this guy, his name was Guglielmo Marconi, Italian inventor. I'll stick with Marconi because the Goliath is making me bite my tongue. Marconi started experimenting radio waves outside his lab. And this is 1899 at this point. You see how we've moved years from 1800s to 1864 to 1899. And still, he's just experimenting it. You see, so Marconi used these radio waves to transfer a telegraph result of the international yacht races in real time. Now, after this had worked and it was amazing, <laughs> this Marconi guy is sharp. You know, and he was like, nah, I'm going to rip, I'm going to milk this thing. And then he decided to start his own wireless company. And he was broadcasting the first transatlantic signal in 1901. There are a lot of dates that I will mention here, but please bear with me. Um, they make it interesting, to be honest. Like, if you don't have the dates, then it's like, oh, what kind of history is this? But like, the dates make it interesting. A few years after that, it was still very limited. You see, at 1901 and even after that, this transmission was limited to just Morse code. That means dots and dashes. That was the only way that this transmission could work. But this had to change. They will bring you the next character. His name, Reginald Vicend. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's R-E-G-I-N-A-L-D-F-E-S-S-E-N-D-E-N. Fesnant. Yeah, I'll stick with that. Now, he sends the first long distance transmission of human voice and music from Massachusetts. Please, I hope I pronounced that well because I'm not going to pronounce it twice. From Massachusetts. Yeah, I did pronounce it twice. I think I got it. Yeah. Now, this was a huge, very, when I say huge, it was a huge achievement for the world of Bluetooth and wireless communication. Basically, the, the whole world of radio waves. 
You see, this birthed what we have, the entertainment based broadcasting, and this started in 1910. It took them 10 years, 10 years from 1901 to 1910 to be able to start, you know, wirelessly transmitting radio music, media music, audio, all that, um, all those old movies that you see them listening to football matches over the radio. This happened in 1910. You see how we've gone from the 1800s down to 1910, and this is all just experimental. Up until 1910, there was no direct use of say, oh, this was the better way of using this. It was all just purely experimental, experimental up to this point. But while we pause at 1910, I want us to skip years ahead. Let's leave all this one. Let's leave all of this and skip down to 1994, the invention of Bluetooth. The origin of Bluetooth can be traced back to 1994 when Dr. Jap Hudson was tasked with finding short-range radio connections. In 1994, we already know that, okay, you know, mobile phones were already a thing because back then, 1964, 1965, 1972, we had all these major inventions of computer, from the printing press down to computer to all these other guys. So at 1994, we've established already that, okay, mobile phones were a thing, we had all of them working. But we needed to experiment. And Dr. Jab Hudson was working for Ericsson's mobile terminal division. His job was to find out how short-range radio connections would work. Now, it was to find a way to enrich the functionality of mobile phones, and which had grown popularity at this time. By experimenting with multiple different factors and assets, Hudson finally was able to create a technology that uses UHF. See, he was able to make it work. Now, the Bluetooth we have now, I'll tell you one secret about it, about like how Bluetooth signals can actually be interfered with somebody sitting down near you. So let's say you have 64 people in a room. There's a possibility that somebody else could be listening to your conversation or your music if you are all connected on different Bluetooth devices. But that's a story for another time. But just stay with me, stay with me. Now, however, Wi-Fi was already operating at this time. And Wi-Fi was operating at the same frequency. So, Hetson came up with a way to use frequency hopping techniques to ensure that Bluetooth connections were reliable and they were tolerance free of interference. Remember when I said that, you know, Bluetooth itself, like if you put 64 people in a room on, and everybody's connected to their own headset and their own phone, there's a possibility that somebody could listen to what another person is hearing. It's because Bluetooth itself, it's, it's a frequency that is everywhere at the same time. So it's not like, oh, this is connected to this phone at the same time. No, the idea is that it's radio waves that is distributed from your phone. They're just being published like an antenna, just publishing the sound. And then your AirPod is picking it up. But you see what he did here? When Hedson came up with the frequency hopping techniques, and that was one of the key things that ensured Bluetooth connections were reliable and tolerant of interference. Now, Bluetooth itself is owned by a company. And the name of the company is SIG. So SIG, it's a company on its own and they own Bluetooth. They own the IP, they own the mark, they own the logo, everything around it. And their job at that time was also not just, you know, coming up with the standard of, you know, how Bluetooth works, but also stopping other people from generating protocols that could combat this. That is another dirty story for another time. The Bluetooth Special Interest Group, SIG, and was formed encompassing the industry leaders of major tech companies. These groups still exist today, they are, and their job is basically to oversee subsequent updates and features of new versions of Bluetooth. This is why you never ever see like any similar competitor to Bluetooth in the market. Like there is nobody else that's trying to say, "Oh, this is my own Red Tooth or whatever that competes with Bluetooth and make wireless technology work different." It's because Bluetooth as a company, the SIG as a company. <laughs> were basically bent on making sure none of this happens. They were making sure theirs was bam, bam, bam. But let me take you back some few steps. Let me take you back to the point where they decided to name it Bluetooth. Of all the names in this world, you decide to name it Bluetooth. Bluetooth is one of those things that have a name that is basically not an acronym for something. You know, most of this in TCP, IP, um, SMPT, all this is Wi-Fi, they all are acronyms for one thing or the other. But Bluetooth is a name. In 1996, the deciding of the name. After the technology became more polished, it was time to start thinking about marketing to consumers and tech companies. 
for implementation into their gadgets. However, the wireless protocol needed a name. They referred to it as a wireless protocol and they had to come up with a name. In 1996, leaders of Intel, Ericsson, Nokia, they all met to discuss how Bluetooth can be standardized between different products and industries. To make things easier, an Intel employee named Jim Kadash suggested a code name that they use in reference. Now, this name was supposed to be a placeholder that they would use in reference of the wireless protocol. You see, what nobody knew was before that time, Jim, Jim Kadash, had been reading about Viking Kings and was particular about this one king. His name was Harold Gumson. And at that time, Harold was nicknamed Bluetooth. He had a rotten tooth that was already turning bluish. He had a bluish color. So Harold was nicknamed Bluetooth. And Harold was one of the Viking kings that came that Jim Kadash was reading about. Harold was famous for uniting Denmark and Norway. And Kadash thought that it was similar to what they were trying to accomplish by uniting PC and cellular industries with short range wireless links. And he was like, you know what? I was like, you know what, Intel, Ericsson, Nokia, I know you guys are all here and trying to find out a name, um, but why don't we just use this guy's name? You know, the guy did this thing and it was actually good. You know, we'll just call it Bluetooth, you know. It's a very fast name, it's catchy, you know, it's interesting, you know. You just, you know, you should use it as a placeholder. You know, let's not the real name, it's just a placeholder. Let's just put it there, you know, as a placeholder, that kind of thing. And they were like, okay, okay, um, let's see. Let's see, let's see how it goes. And they did it. So they couldn't come up with a name. They just use it as a placeholder. When time came, when they were like, okay, this technology is a serious thing. This technology is now, okay, a big thing. Now let's come up with a serious name for it. They had already used Bluetooth in their patents and in their licensing and in all their legal stuff. And it was almost impossible to start changing the name now to be like, oh, let's go to the patent laws. I'm going to change it. Let's go and change the licensing we've already gotten it was almost impossible to change Bluetooth. So they were like, um, Jim, I see what you've done here. Nice one. We can't change the name. and We're just going to leave it that way. And since it was a place of time that everybody knew, it just got stuck. It's like that nickname in school that you never, ever, ever forget because everybody does, like everybody just calls you that name. Nobody ever forgets. It was, it happened one time, you fell on the floor and all of a sudden people are calling you Humpty Dumpty. And boom. Anyway, a classmate of two years ago, three years ago, six years ago, sees you and they were like, HB. I was like, what's that? They're like, Humpty Dumpty. I'm like, oh shit. You know, even though you are buff and you are fleshy and you have a lot of meat on your body, it was because you Humpty Dumpty. And that's how it was. Bluetooth became the iconic name for it. And the logo that's the icon for Bluetooth is a combination of H and B, the initials of Harold Bluetooth. If you've listened this far, thank you. I want to tell you about what's podcasting newsletter. It's a newsletter that delivers interesting podcast recommendations to people who are in tech or who just have interest in interesting stuff. So you check the link in the description to subscribe to the What's Podcasting newsletter and tell a friend to tell a friend. That's it. Moving forward. The first ever Bluetooth device, 1999, 25 years ago. See, once the name has been established and companies were already using this technology in their devices, right? Consumer Bluetooth gadgets began to appear. And the first ever Bluetooth device was a hands-free mobile headset that was launched in 1999. That same year, the first Bluetooth specification 1.0 was launched alongside, allowing for releases of many other wireless devices. Remember, Ericsson, Nokia, and Intel were the three companies that sat down to decide for a name. At that time, and the Ericsson T36 was the first ever mobile phone to ever utilize the Bluetooth technology. But there was a downside. It worked the best it can ever work when it's combined with Ericsson's hands-free headsets. Now, it's just like Apple right now that Apple's devices only work well with Apple devices. Back then, the Ericsson T36 only works well with the Ericsson headset. And this was not the best choice for everybody. Ericsson took this and they created the Ericsson T39. It was the reversed version and that became accessible for way more consumers that were beginning to use wireless technology in their daily lives. Just like now we have the Humane Pin and we have the Rabbit R1. We all know they are terrible products, at least the reviews that people have seen that oh, they are terrible products. 
But you see, these are just the first early stage of wireless AI computers, I mean devices that we've seen. There's a long way to go. Like 10, 5, 6, we don't know. But just like the Ericsson T36 to the Ericsson T39 that changed the game entirely for Bluetooth. Who knows? The standard of Bluetooth. The Bluetooth 1.0 was revolutionary. It was wireless protocol, especially since they had never been anything like it. It was flexible packets-based protocol that had a wide variety of uses, making it perfect for hands-free application. It could be used when washing plates, when singing. At this time, this was a new thing. Like for us now, it is, oh, I want to go for a jog, put my wireless AirPod and I just jog. To them, it was like, oh my God. It was like the invention of the Walkman. The Walkman was one of the first wired headphones that worked for Sony who created it. And it was crazy. The Walkman changed the game for a lot of people. And this Bluetooth 1.0 was, it had similar effects. It was crazy. However, the first version of Bluetooth had its fair share of issues. Namely, the data speed was picked at 721 kbs and with a limited range that was unable to reach further than 10 meters. Maximum. Now, since obstacles like walls, furniture were affecting the Bluetooth connection, it was very, very limited. And to some people, it was, nah, I would just rather use my wireless headman, my wireless walkman. Interestingly enough, the earliest version of Bluetooth was never designed for full bandwidth music in mind. Now, despite this being its main use today, the 721 kbs speed was enough for voice calling and it was not until subsequent versions that wireless music streaming became reality. And in 1990, in 1999, you see, these companies that were streaming, these companies that were doing all these things, they didn't really, you know, it was not a popular thing. Streaming music was not, ooh, this is the life-changing thing at the point in time. So it was okay. It was okay that people could use the Bluetooth to make calls across different offices and that, that works for them. And they could put it in their ear. If you watch the show, The Office, you can legit see them navigating through the history of technology within the office where they will use wired and then Dwight will come in with a Bluetooth headset and then, you know, down the line, Pam will have one. Like, this was how it was. It was used for making calls, basically. Let's go back in 2017. The Bluetooth launched its most recent update, which is now the Bluetooth 5.0. The protocol has improved the number of its core features to better adapt the modern technology, namely Bluetooth 5.0 has extended range of 240 meters. It improves the comparison speed by all of that. It has doubled the uh, it has doubled and multiplied the broadcasting message capacity by eight compared to the previous version of Bluetooth 4.2. Also, new Bluetooth 5.0 consumes low energy and prevents your battery from dying faster as compared to Bluetooth 5.0 or 3.2 and all of that. Now, the ability for you to stream audio with two different devices in one at once came in Bluetooth 5.0. It is that thing where your laptop will be connected to your headset and your phone will be connected to your headset and then somebody calls you on your phone and you can pick it and then your laptop is playing music and you can listen. That came in Bluetooth 5.0. And one beautiful thing that the SIG did with Bluetooth was they made it backward compatible. Unlike most Apple devices or other phones that, oh, after a certain while, you can't use a certain you know, operating system enough because, oh, it's not backward compatible. It's not compatible with the old version. Now, just like the Apple Pencil Pro that you cannot use it on other devices except on the new one, um, with the Bluetooth, you can use it with other Bluetooth versions. Let's say your phone has a Bluetooth of 3.2 and your AirPod is a Bluetooth of 5.0. You can basically use them together. They will be compatible. Now, this was one of those things that Bluetooth still did today that makes Bluetooth more accessible to people and makes it really, really good. I'm beginning to believe that free software, open source software, non-profit softwares kind of go the extra mile to make things really good. Like they go the extra mile to make it well. Like most of the knowledge we have now is from Wikipedia, which is non-profit. It's crazy. But in conclusion to this whole story, we use Bluetooth nowadays to communicate wirelessly, to do many things, to cook, to watch porn, to watch videos, to do a lot of shit that nobody really cares about. And this all started in the 1800s with somebody's wild guess and well-calculated guess. Let me put it that way. Maybe radio waves can be transferred through wireless signals, like through the air. And then this was worked on by different people. And then we had Ericsson come in play and we have the SIG was formed. And then we had, you know, 
oh, Herald the Great, and then Bluetooth, and then, oh, uniting Denmark and Norway, and all of a sudden, we have what we have today. That's it, ladies and gentlemen, that comes to the brief history. That comes to the end of the brief history of Bluetooth. To be honest, this is just one of those facts that you can spill out at the bar or just talk about it with somebody and let them know that, oh, you know something somewhere about something they don't know about. But that's the end. If you have listened, may you be blessed. Thank you very much. This is Drones. And see you next time. Bye. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Before you go. Oh, you know, I mentioned that, oh, when people gather together, 64 different people gather together in one room, it's possible that there will be interference with your own Bluetooth, especially if every single person is using their own Bluetooth. I will explain that in depth in the next podcast. Wait till next week and I'll tell you what that is. Um, that's it, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Thank you for listening. This is Not Just Design, and I'm your host, Brooks. See you next time.